Hello, everybody. Walt Corey. Um, so I would, to start off, wellness is, financial wellness, it's just like anything from eating healthy, going to the gym, anything that you feel like is wellness, it's creating good behaviors inside of on a daily basis, monthly basis, to make sure you're getting to where you want to be. And it, it, it's a, in, in today's age, it's kind of a new age thinking of making sure that I, my whole life is doing the right thing in the sense of healthy, well, healthy life, but also healthy finances. And one of the biggest things that is hitting the entire country is debt. No matter if it's personal, credit card, government, corporate, doesn't matter. Debt is a major issue, and it's because of financial education that individuals and, and governments don't completely understand how it works and what it is and how it affects people on a daily basis. So now I'm going to start talk a little bit more about debt. Good debt versus bad debt. Changing the way you think about money. That's the goal of this, of this discussion and the, and the goal of what, who, who Get Well is. How the rich think about money. They think about it very differently. And this is a great quote. Not sure who said it, but it's a great quote. Rich people use debt to leverage investments and grow cash flow. Poor people use debt to buy things to make rich people richer. They have a totally different way of looking at debt and a totally different way of, of, of what we look at debt and what the wealthy look at debt. They look at ways to put a lot of individuals into debt so they make more interest and more money. So they're the ones being paid interest where we don't understand a lot of those basic knowledge. So we're the one paying a bill every month and paying them interest. And they're making money on things that they shouldn't be. But with that thought in mind and understanding, because, we, because of that, that thought process of not understanding what you're paying out on interest or what you're paying out on debt, well, there's a lot of people making a lot of money on people because they don't understand it. So today's plan of action, I want to talk a little bit about, so you guys know a little bit about me and where I come from, good debt versus bad debt, affordable versus unaffordable debt, a plan of action if you have bad debt to pay it off, and then conclusions and questions. So first, I started with Merrill Lynch right out of school. Merrill Lynch hired me on as a financial advisor. I went through their program. As a financial advisor, helping people with their retirement planning, their cash flow, making sure that we're hitting their goals short-term, long-term basis, if it's education, retirement, business planning, 401ks. We tried to help people in the way of a planning basis. But Merrill Lynch didn't have that same type of, of, of feeling. They didn't believe a little bit of what I did. And I'm not changing Merrill Lynch. So I was on the search for somebody that was into that was into helping individuals, more of an education basis of still managing money and still doing the same type of planning, but just a different approach of how to help people. So what is good debt? Good debt is it acquires an appreciating asset. So that could be a home, a business, something that will go up in value, any type of real estate property. And the main thing to always remember, two things, is does it generate cash flow? So if you are buying a house, and you rent it out to somebody, you're generating cash flow from that. So even though you go on Zillow, it might be going up and down, the value of that home might be going up and down, you're still renting it out to somebody and somebody's still paying you income. So you're, now you're creating cash flow on an asset, not buying a new car or buying a new ring that you can't create cash flow on unless you're doing Uber. But other than that, it's hard to create cash flow on a lot of things that you purchase. So you want to get in the mindset of when you purchase something, assets versus liabilities. And I'll give Robert Kiyosaki out of Rich Dad Poor Dad, he talks a lot about this, of the idea of what assets are and what liabilities are and making sure you understand what creates value and what doesn't. Examples, business loan, real estate property, student loan debt. So those are things that this will, business loan debt, maybe buy new manufacturing to increase your production and more efficient. Real estate property, renting something out. Student loan debt. You want to make sure, now this could be bad, but you want to make sure that if you do go back to school, you're increasing your salary down the road. If you stay the same or only five, ten thousand more, but you put yourself into twenty, thirty thousand in debt, then that's, doesn't, that's not a good business decision. That's a good, not a good payoff. So you'd be making a bad business decision. An example, so something very simple to understand. Buy a home for $250,000. We put, we put down payment of 20%, which is $50,000. Mortgage balance is now 200 at a rate of four, fixed rate of 4% over a 30-year time period. The PITI, principal interest, taxes, insurance, is about $1,200 $1, $1, a month. If you would rent that out 
for $200. This is a good example of what good debt is. You rent that out for $2,000. You're now creating positive cash flow of $800, and you're also put possible appreciation down the road if you want to resell this 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Now you're creating cash flow on a yearly basis, monthly basis, as well as potentially selling it at a higher asset. This is just like buying a high quality stock. It's the same type of thinking. You buy a high quality stock that pays you a dividend every single, every single quarter. So now you're making three, four, five percent, depending on the company. And then down the road, you also get appreciation out of it. And you can resell that as well. What is bad debt? So bad debt is purchasing items, this purchasing items that are disposable goods or services, something that you don't create cash flow, something you, that doesn't depreciate, appreciate in value, something that goes down in value over time. A good example, a new car right off the lot. Immediately loses 20, 30, 40% of the value. Uh, other things, credit card, unless it's something in a business, not most debt, credit card debt, you're paying somebody else interest, making somebody else really rich, 12, 15, 20 plus percent in interest. Well, just $10,000 debt of 20% interest, you're paying somebody else $2,000 a year in interest. So now you really owe in one year $12,000. So vacation, you never want to borrow to go on vacation because it's not creating an asset. Unaffordable mortgage, auto loans, 401k, you want to keep those assets tax deferred. You want to keep that money in there. Uh, and unaffordable student loans, money that you don't get salary later down the road. Um, bad debt, credit card debt purchases. So this is an example. So anybody, we all do this stuff, TV, anything at Nordstrom's, anything shopping. We go out and we purchase, make a purchase on a credit card. And just for example, $100. And we buy a, t we buy a shirt or we buy a shoes. And for a year, we, we didn't have save enough money in the bank or we don't make enough money to be able to pay that off. So now, a year later, that balance is still $100. But because of 12% interest rate on the credit card, now you owe the credit card company $112. The resale value on that shoes or on those, that shirt that you bought is 20, 30, maybe 50, $50 max if, if you're lucky. Well, that's an extremely fast appreciating asset. So when you're paying somebody else $112, it only cost you 100, but now it's only a resale value of much, much less. And that's a bad asset to buy in, in an appreciation. Affordable versus unaffordable. So this is, this is a little, this is a lot of the same, but an affordable, asset acquires an appreciating asset, it doesn't leave the financial strain, is paid off by retirement, and doesn't impact retirement savings. So when something's an affordable debt, and we'll, I'll show you an example after this, you want to make sure that inside of your total budget, it's something that you can fit inside and it doesn't affect the rest of your lifestyle. If you're, if you're purchasing a car, for example, and you buy a car that's outside, now you might get the loan for it, but if you're buying that car that isn't inside of your budget, it starts affecting your food, or it starts affecting your, your retirement savings, it starts affecting your, the rest of your family's uh, exp basic expenses you need or savings, then that's something that turns into unaffordable debt, something that you can't purchase because now it's affecting the rest of your long-term goals and then immediate of being able to just to live on what you need. And that's also unaffordable debt. Does it hurt your credit score? Does it delay your retirement date? So these are things today, and which is great, Merv said, everybody here is young, I'm telling you, the earlier you save, the more time you have in compound interest. The, the, Einstein said the most, powerful t the most powerful tool in this universe is compound interest because the longer you are able to, four, five, six, seven percent of compound interest over time with yield, dividends coming in, whatever it is, reinvesting, that is how people become really wealthy over a long period of time. And you don't have to make a lot of money to become very wealthy. We have clients that are, that are, that are that, you, that were maintenance individuals, but they, they retired with over a million dollars in assets, and somebody asked, how the heck did that happen? It's because over a 35, 40 year time period, they were just saving the, just the small amounts, which is far less than everybody in this room could do, but, far, but, but just saving those small amounts over a 30, 40 year time period, that's how, that's how, this, this can, this, that's how it works for a lot of people. Uh, cash flow, so just a quick example, you make $50,000, this is a cash flow planning of taxes, savings, and the rest of your life. We know that government's going to take your mortgage, they're going to take uh, income taxes, they're going to take social security tax, everything else, sales tax that goes into this. 15, we take 15, 30%, $15,000 out of taxes. Savings, 
to be able to create the income that you need in retirement by 65, 62, 70 in that time period, you're going to need to save at least 20% of your, your, your goal. And this will keep you on track. You may be able to save more or less, but this will keep you on track. And this is a good safe number to go with. If you are saving that over, over a long period of time, this will put you in the right situation. Life, the rest of this, and if you're able to budget yourself underneath this number, then that will create the place that you want to be and trying to live off of what you can of $25,000. Mortgage affordable. When you're buying a mortgage, it's not about what the bank is going to give you a mortgage, what they deem to be okay for you to pay. It's something that what you want to do. Because of the last slide that we just looked at, if you're paying something too high in a mortgage every month, that's going to take away from your savings, your savings bucket that's going to be able to save for you and you keep up there with that 20%, you may be able to retire a lot sooner than you think. So anything under 25% of your gross income, so assuming that you're making $100,000 or $50,000, you want to keep your, month, your, your yearly mortgage, and that could be as a household, under 25%. And if you're able to do that, then you're putting yourself in the situation that's going to help you with the rest of the goals. Anything over 30 is a, I'll just tell you, it's a bad idea because then it's eating into the rest of your life. Example, so John makes $70,000 a year. Same example from before, $250,000 mortgage, 4.25% interest rate. The monthly payments are $1,230. At 70% it has 70 yearly salary, 21% of John's income. That's a good affordable because he's still able to use the rest of the money towards his life and savings. An unaffordable mortgage would be, same example, but he took a 30-year rate and the mortgage is now 400. Well, he wanted that big home. He feels better in the big home and he's able to brag to his friends and he feels better because he's trying to keep up with the Joneses. Well, the problem is it's now 34% of his income and now he doesn't have anything else to be able to enjoy his life, to be able to save because a lot of individuals will put all of their money into their home, but now they're cash poor. And to be a healthy business or a healthy, healthy household, you want to be cash rich increasing your cash flow, because that's what a good business is. So if you have credit card debt, or if you have debt that you deem is, is, is not good debt, bad debt that we just talked about, you want to put a plan together of it laying out exactly what everything that you own inside of it. If it's credit card, house, high interest rate house, maybe uh, old credit card, old student loans, see if you can roll it over into something lower or consolidate it. You want to first build out a budget, know exactly where you're Fixed expenses are, variable expenses are, what you have to spend on a monthly basis. Lower your fixed income. See if there's ways to lower the fixed income going out. That's all the cash flow that's going out to other people. Make a list of the debts again. Lay out exactly what you owe, what the interest rates are, how far out, what the minimum payments are. Then look and see again if you can transfer those balances or consolidate those debts, what you can do. Once you do that, there's two ways, schools of thought that we believe are the best. One of them we, we, we like even more, and that's snowball or avalanche method. And the methods to pay down the debt, so the snowball method, that is by taking, when you lay out all of your debts, you have a debt of $500, $700, $1,000, $1,500. $1, the snowball method is you start at the top of the hill and you know how aggravating it is. A lot of people get overwhelmed with it because it's too much, and it's too much for them to handle, it's too much for them to think about. But if you lay it out, where it's the 500, the 700, the 1,000, the 1,500 dollars in debt, and you start with the smallest amount, and you get rid of that small amount, and you go, oh, I can cross that one off. And then you go to the next one, and you can cross that one off. Well, even though you still have a lot left down here, you're still creating the snowball effect of this confidence that, oh, I can get the next one. I can get the next one. It's just like going, it's, it's anything, that, anything in your life, you start with the simple stuff just to get a victory and get your confidence up, and then you start to move down the road. And you, get the, you, you pay the rest of them off. The other one is the avalanche, where you start off with the highest interest rate. So if an interest rate is 12%, no matter what the balance is, you pay that one off first because you're paying somebody else 12% interest, which is obviously way too high. Or 20% interest, you pay the highest off first, no matter the balance. And then from there down, whatever is 12%, 6%, 5%, you pay them off that way. So who is Wella? The getwella.com that we went to it previously, we were created by a firm called Capital Investment Advisors 
because we wanted, again, to help people on education, creating behavior for themselves so it's easier for them to, is, it, it's easier for them to be able to create their own behavior and do the right things on a daily basis, monthly basis. We're, in a sense, we're a digital advisor. So what the robo-advisors are, are individuals that you can just put at the absolute lowest cost and you put your money in and then you have an algorithm do it for you. We didn't believe in that because a lot of individuals need more than just the investments. They need someone to talk about their plan. They need to talk about their, their investments. They need to talk about debt or whatever else it may be and, and, and be able to think in a bigger picture instead of just throwing your money to somebody else. So what our founders did was we created something that took from the traditional advisor world and also what the robo-advisor world, so we're able to lower our costs but still deliver a service that individuals need. We work with our main individuals that we really specialize in work with. There's a lot of people. You have a million dollars, $750,000 plus. You really get good service. You, you, you'll get good service. People usually pay, pay attention to you. The Merrill Lynch's of the world will, 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 will open the door and they'll, they'll give you the right type of investments and asset allocation and they'll meet you on a quarterly basis, six months. But if you have somebody under that, it's very uncommon to get any attention. It's very uncommon that people will, they'll usually sell you an annuity. They'll usually sell you a, a, a shares uh, upload front, you pay somebody four or five percent the mutual fund. We don't believe in that, which is why we're a fee-based only firm. We don't sell commission products, anything. We're not allowed to. We're only allowed to, to charge a flat percentage, which is one percent, which is no matter how much you have, it's a flat one percent to help you with your investments, with an asset allocation that a lot of the individuals that, that are the seven fifty a million dollars above get, but we do that at a lower cost and use internet and the, play and the technology to be able to keep those, keep that at, at an affordable cost for everybody. So that's it for me today. I appreciate, thank you very much for your time.